recognize Ms. Takuda from Hawaii for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Following up on the gentleman's from Maryland's comments, as an Asian American woman representing an ethnically diverse district that would find offense with Mr. Wade's work and conclusions in regards to race, I ask that the letter to the editor, signed by more than 100 geneticists and biologists opposing the use of their research in Mr. Wade's book, be entered officially into the record. This speaks to his professional credibility and calls into question his very presence on this panel. Without objection. Thank you. One thing the COVID-19 pandemic made clear is the need for reliable, real-time public health data. Without it, people of color and the most vulnerable in our communities are disproportionately impacted. We don't have the infrastructure to get needed resources to them, and people die. We in Congress must continue to support our federal public health agencies, not just in determining the origins of COVID-19, but in improving data and analytics technology so we can pinpoint and slow the spread of infectious disease. At the beginning of the pandemic, we observed difficulties scaling up the appropriate public health infrastructure to track and keep pace with COVID-19. This was a catastrophic wake-up call that we were grossly unprepared to deal with the pandemic. Coupled with a lack of action, admission, and leadership by the Trump administration, people died. Dr. Alwater, let's focus on the facts and let's put people first. We need to understand the origins of COVID-19. There's no argument about that here to prevent and prepare for future pandemics. What do public health agencies and researchers need to do now, learning from this pandemic, to ensure that we can quickly test and trace when faced with new pathogens of pandemic potential? <clears throat> well, my, my work as a clinician uh, deals with public health departments. I'm not a public health department uh, person. But each state has its own department and then liaises with the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, many, I know many of our state health departments don't have enough funds to accomplish what they want to. Each state is sort of self-funding and has other federal monies too, but there's just not enough resources. Uh, there's not enough people. And we have to go back to workforce issues, trainees. We need to get people excited entering these careers. I'll mention that for infectious diseases, uh, only 56% of our training programs filled in 2022. There are a number of reasons for that, um, including low compensation. I know in public health officials, clinical laboratories, we have trouble finding people that want to do that work and getting them into training programs. So these are absolutely vital from both clinical laboratories, public health laboratories. These are our sentinel findings for you know, trying to see if there's an outbreak, is there something new impacting um, the health, not only in our country, but then expand that internationally as well, because these same efforts are just as important as keeping peace. Thank you. So clearly the federal government needs to do more in terms of support and resources to both our state and local public health agencies in order for us to have a strong infrastructure set up. Um, regardless of how the novel coronavirus came to be, it is important we continue to invest in public health infrastructure and invest in research on pathogens of pandemic potential with appropriate guardrails and strict oversight and guidelines. To do nothing, quite frankly, is to have learned nothing from this tragedy and set us up for failure and more death in the future. Dr. Patel, what would happen if Congress blocked federal funding for BSL-3 and BSL-4 laboratories because of misinformation and fear-mongering surrounding lab leaks? What would happen if there was a moratorium on gain-of-function research, which includes developing medical capabilities, countermeasures, and surveillance capacities? Are you asking me? Yeah, are you asking me? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Dr. Allwater. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we, we, you know, if we have very strict rules and shut down or halt research within the U.S., there may be others outside our borders carrying this out. Uh, it's already been mentioned that there are countries that may not participate with uh, standard practices and, and, and agreements. So um, this is not an area I labor in, but as a clinician and from my infectious diseases perspective within the society, I think research that does examine these very carefully, and as you said, with guardrails, with oversight, um, is important. And you know, there can be debate about where you draw the line in terms of doing this research. Um, but I, I think not to do it could leave us unprepared. 
Um, and of course, there's different points of view of this, and uh, this has been going back and forth for a while, but I do think it needs to be vigorously uh, re-examined. Thank you very much. And I know, Dr. Metzl, you have also concluded these things in your testimony as well in support for this research. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, we would be making a grave error if we shut down virology, if we shut down epidemiology, if we didn't have uh, high containment virology labs. I think everybody agrees with that. The only question is, what are the guardrails? And when we have a situation such as this, where it appears very likely uh, that a, a lab error may have led to this whole pandemic, that forces us to, to be very careful and to do the kind of review that we all need to, to be working on together. Thank you. Now recognize Ms. Green.